Hi, uh, my name is Yuan Nango. I am an architect, educated in architect, working with uh, both visual art and architecture. Um, I'm Sami, uh, living in Tromsø in the north of Norway, or in Sápmi, as we call our territories. Um, at the moment, I'm in my studio in Tromsø uh, at the TKF Lofte. It's an uh, it's a shared studio space I share with four other Sami artists here in town. My field of interest has, since I was a student, been focusing around Sami and indigenous architecture. Uh, for me as a student, I uh, realized very fast that there was very little work done on this in a contemporary scale. Most of the uh, material I found on Sami and indigenous architecture had this kind of folkloristic sort of perspective to it, um, thinking uh, or presenting it as something historical and something with um, something which, which to me uh, felt wrong, since uh, the Sami culture uh, in which I was raised is uh, strongly alive, in my opinion. Uh, I wanted to do something with that. So since my study times, I've been making different projects, which are kind of like platforms for discussing, developing, critically thought crit and critically thinking about indigenous and Sami architecture. For this presentation. Uh, I want to show you a project called Giri Gumpi, also known as the Sami Architectural Library. Uh, it has the web address gumpi.space. Easy to remember. Uh, <clears throat> since my study times, already 15 years ago, uh, I was uh, looking a lot at Sami and in indigenous architecture, and I was gathering a lot of material. It was done a very little research on this, so I had to really dig in, dig in a lot of different historical sources and also contemporary magazines uh, to gather all the material that was available. Uh, and slowly, slowly over the years, I built some kind of a, I say, I would say, an archive of uh, of. Uh, of Sami architectural sources, sources that were taken from historical books, ethnographic sources, but also more critically and contemporary theory around architecture and philosophy that I felt was relevant for a discourse concerning minority rights, land, indigenous land rights, uh, decolonization, queer feminist theory, uh, things that I sort of saw as uh, inspirational for a discussion about Sami architecture. The library is built uh, in a gumpi. A gumpi is a reindeer herder's hut. It is a fantastic small little um, typology of vernacular Sami architecture that is used by the reindeer herders when they move with their uh, reindeer herds from the winter grazing land to the coastal summer area. Um, and it's a place to, it's a mobile home. Uh, used for this spring migration uh, that is usually self-made and it comes in 100 different forms and shapes uh, and here's some images of them. It's an ongoing research archive that I'm doing where I also uh, interview and collaborate with different builders on you know sort of creating a, uh, some reflex reflections around this beautiful typology. Um, I'm also making a film about the Gumpi, which will be released next year. Um, the, the construction of the Giri Gumpi uh, started in uh, Hashta, which is a small community south of Tromsø, where I live, where they every year uh, are, are organizing uh, what's called the Festbildne in Hashta. Uh, and um, for that uh, project, I sort of invited a lot of different uh, builders and designers, craftsmen and Sami architects to come there and to sort of partake in the creation of this library structure itself. And here you see some images from that. Uh, we held a whole day seminar about Sami architect architecture, where we invited different uh, designers and architects that have been involved in working with the Sami architectural, um, uh, I guess, landscapes. So there's, uh, of course, a few buildings that are designed for the Sami community, but uh, absolutely none of these are designed by Sami architects. 
um, that is signed by outsiders. So um, it was interesting for us to, to sort of, uh, for a whole day, question each other about Sami and sort of share our different perspectives on Sami architecture. And we had a very educative day. You will also, on this uh, web page, uh, be able to find um, four hour long video documentation of that uh, seminar itself. Um, yeah, we were also, as I said, uh, gathering all the eight Sami architects that uh, exist. Uh, and uh, it was a really powerful sort of moment to start to develop this sort of autonomous, indigenous grounded uh, platform for architectural discourse and thinking. And I think that's really needed. I think we as indigenous people, we really need this type of autonomous platform where we can d discuss self-representation through architecture, where we can also, you know, meet each other uh, on an eye to eye sort of level uh, without necessarily always dealing with this sort of us and them conflicts uh, and sort of uh, challenges that we are so often um, exposed to when we work with architecture and indigenous representation. Um, <clears throat> one of the, I, I guess, very interesting things we discussed during that seminar that I've also been talking about and other scholars like Elin Haugdal, which is a professor of architectural history here in my hometown and also Sunne Vaskolnes, which is also an architect who's been working extensively on Sami architecture. Um, what they've been talking about and what we also talked about at this seminar was um, was that sort of the, the, the high amount of buildings designed for Sami community that use the traditional lavu, uh, which is our tent, traditional tent used by the nomadic reindeer herders moving with the herds in the mountain areas, it is very much similar in uh, aesthetic way to the teepee from North America, which are more, I guess, famous and more people know about. But, but the lava is also, it's also a very recognizable, you know, type of geometrical form that stands out in the landscape. And it's, it's really connected as a very unique sort of architectural typology to, to the Sami culture. And when, what, what the architects have done when they have, you know, been sort of offered the opportunity to design for Sami community is of course, to, to get you know, started by looking at sort of what's culturally significant in the architecture of this culture. And, uh, and there, there's a lot of um, uh, examples which, in which you can see that the architects, of course, have landed on the most obvious and sort of fascinating shape, which is the, the lavu. And they have used this uh, traditional tent, the lavu, as a geometrical starting point and a reference point for an architecture which... Um, which uh, yeah, which which connects the architecture to Sami culture. It makes it Sami archi architecture. And I think that when you start, when I started looking at this, I I, re I realized that there were quite a lot of these, and it was almost like all of these uh, architects, non Sami architects, designing for our community were doing the same thing. They were taking this very sort of exotifying symbol of our culture and putting that into an otherwise quite conventional type of architecture. And I started to sort of maybe <laughs> wanting, to, I wanted to criticize and I wanted to create some sort of reflection around why it is like this. I wanted the Sami community itself to you know question what kind of architecture do we need? How do we represent ourselves best? But also trying to sort of create a awareness amongst architects uh, designing for us um, that, you know, our culture might actually have a lot more to offer a stronger sort of spatial concepts or, you know, maybe there's material cultural aspects or maybe the landscape itself and our relation to the landscape can sort of uh, be used as some sort of a starting point for an architecture and a design. And that I think it's, I think it's very limiting to see how, how this, um, uh, how how the how so many architects were doing the same, and I just coined the phrase the giant lavu syndrome. Um, expanding on that, I also made a selection of sweaters that are based on uh, images I took from these um, 
from these buildings and I made the knitting pattern with 10 different colors and I traveled back to these villages where these giant lavos are existing in the Sami community and uh, and I I was uh, and I and I asked uh, knitters to knit a selection of sweaters there's now six sweaters in this series and it keeps growing it's been exhibited in many different exhibitions um, internationally uh, so critically thinking about architecture and representation, it brought me to, to the question, what, what is Sami architecture? Where, where, what could you sort of really, really define as something Sami? And, and maybe, maybe it's interesting to sort of try and look a little bit beyond the, the visual aesthetics or the idea of representation, representation through form. Um, and maybe look more at some sort of an attitude, uh, or or an, a way of thinking more than a way of uh, uh, shaping and forming. So, so what I found uh, and what I sort of been talking quite a lot about is what I like to call the indigenuity or the Sami competence of improvisation, which is a, a distinct sort of attitude which uh, in which um, Sami Samis are you know uh, in sort of um, an very immediate do it yourself i can fix it type of way creating and designing solving problems on the land when problems or challenges occur um, and i've been gathering photos of this i made a project together with another sami designer and, and artist called uh, Celia figenska tourism called the indigenuity project uh, and here are some of the images that we've been gathering sort of we traveled around documenting this type of phenomenon, the indigenuity. Uh, indigenuity, of course, being some kind of a, a word play on indigeneity and ingenuity and this sort of indigenous ingenuity that you find on the land. Here you see an image, for example, of my father's life, be life west, uh, which he makes when he goes uh, on the river with my aunt on a boat. Uh, he has some old water cans and some wood can um, wood firewood holders not knitted together as a, some sort of a emergency uh, floating device um, yeah here's an example of a post box stand here's a um, scarecrow made from an old bottle this is an interesting example uh, also from the northern parts of Nunavut, which is a sort of a small seal oil lamp made from an, an old discarded frying pan. This is, um, this is an interesting example of um, actually a, an old refrigerator remade into a small smokehouse. Uh, these two chambered refrigerators were in this village on the Finnish side of Sapmi, which we visited really high on demand when they were when they were broken because they had these two chambers and you could put the sort of the smoking source in one chamber and then because of the insulation you would sort of uh, be able to cold smoke the um, fish or the meat on the uh, putting that in the other chamber very practical and interesting um, design which is sort of also becoming typologies people are coping each other and and solving this uh, issues as they go. Some things are also really, really cultural specific, like this uh, part of a log, which you see here is, uh, it's actually, um, it's a device, a tool used for smashing and beating shoe grass. Shoe grass is traditionally used in the reindeer herding, uh, sorry, the, the reindeer fur uh, shoes. Uh, and, um, and this, this tool is used to sort of uh, smash the, the the grass on it and to make it soft um, and this is of course something you cannot go to the hardware store and buy uh, it's something you really got to uh, make yourself um, so there's also something about that cycle of things I also really love it when you see this sort of uh, very west Western commercial type of uh, prod products re sort of programmed or repurposed reappropriated you could even say into you know culturally specific use like for example uh, our we have this traditional sami big knives which we which we um, uh, sometimes can de-rust using coca-cola because coca-cola actually etches steel 
because of the acidity of it. So uh, this is something uh, I find quite interesting in a way, in a cultural way, that there's this sort of almost like this element of cultural resistance uh, within this um, immediate indigenuity and way of sort of uh, acting self-sufficiently uh, on the land. Maybe most important is the, is the examples of, um, of Dwoji experiments. I've been sort of parallel to, to, uh, to working with uh, exposing the books, creating a library, which is social, which people can come and visit. I've also been thinking that it's important to somehow include the traditional knowledge, which is also in so many ways uh, an important part of sharing and thinking about design and architecture is it's all the knowledge that exists within the craft itself and and in in Sami culture we have um, a, an old term for our craft which is called Dwoji and and Dwoji is maybe in my point of view the most sort of autonomous specifically Sami cultural skill set that we actually have and I. So therefore, I thought that as a part of the Girje Gumpi and the building of this small scale Sami architectural library, I thought it would be nice to also develop an interior that could be somehow um, uh, uniquely developed and experimentally sort of playing around with some of these uh, traditions that we have uh, and expose them as traditions, but also try and renew them in a way and use that use the space as some sort of an open ended uh, format where we can really investigate and renew in an innovative way our tradition. And um, one of the people I collaborated with for that was Katarina Spikskum, which you see an image of here. She's an amazing doyar who's been sewing a bed, curtains, uh, sleeping sets, and also here you see her making a sleeping bag of reindeer fur. We also invited the amazing painter Anders Sunna, a Sami activist and painter who uh, talks a lot about reindeer herding and the sort of colonial behavior of the Swedish state and how his family has been forced out of their traditional herding grazing lands. Um, and I invited him to come and paint a big fresque, uh, like a, a roof painting in the structure. Uh, it's an ongoing project, so when I've been traveling with the Gide Gumpi to different locations, Anders quite often comes along and he continues the painting. So it sort of shapes itself uh, following the movement of the structure. Um, Katarina, the doyar who's making the interior, is also, has also been partaking in different sort of chapters of, of the Gide Gumpi's journey. Continuing this conversation about what Sami architecture is, the website and the Giri Gumpi, the archive itself, con contains a lot of different sort of um, photo materials. For example, this photo series, which is from, uh, it's partially from Newfoundland and partially from Greenland, where I've traveled uh, and also looked at other um, uh, DIY traditions that are culturally specific. The, these are, this is a series of images of roadside gardens which is a very interesting phenomenon on the very, very north tip of Newfoundland where the soil is not that fertile or deep, but when they built the highway to St. Anthony up the north, they uh, actually turned over so much soil that actually in the ditches along the road, the most fertile and sort of deepest type of earth exists. And it's a perfect way of growing potatoes and cabbage. And, and a lot of this sort of informal, not really legally, um, organized type of gardens are made uh, along the roadside and of course I found them very aesthetically interesting to observe because all of these were built from really you know a lot of discarded material whatever was at hand um, and there were quite a lot of similarities to these these structure which you see here which are the dog structures of um, uh, northern Greenland where you know people that are doing dog hunting are are also having to build their sort of small makeshift informal type of structures to, to hold the dogs and the dog food and the tools that are used for dog sledding during the summer specifically. Uh, I find them very, really interesting and in some sort of aesthetical expressions of uh, mater this material and flow and what sort of materials are accessible, what are sort of cheap and, and handy and also uh, there's also some kind of a freedom in the way they're, exp they're expressing themselves as spaces.
Uh, also on the website, I have uh, some text that I've written. There's also uh, my my magazine, the fan scenes called Sami Huxendaila, which was, I guess, where everything started for me. They're already 12, 13, 14 years old. Um, they are, there. it's a project called Sami Huxendaila, which means the Sami art of building. And, and it's a magazine that I made as a, as a diploma student of architecture in Trondheim and at NTNU, where I uh, was mapping the indigenous architecture and Sami architecture uh, and creating these small magazines that came out in four issues uh, during the years between 2007 and 2009. You can access them and have a look at them. There's also um, other texts that are newer and also texts that I sort of acquired elsewhere. Um, there's also a possibility to watch my uh, uh, latest production, which is called the Post-Capitalist Architecture TV Show, which comes in three part. And they're all available here um, on the on the virtual uh, library of Sami architecture, the Giri Gumpi. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, I want to end the presentation here. And I really hope you have uh, time to come and visit uh, the website. It's not going to be up for ever we have decided to make it a temporary project so for a three months period i think it is uh, you'll be able to log on to gumpi.space and flip through all the sources the texts the image archives and of course uh, also find inspiration in the all the books that we also sort of took photos of and presented here um yeah thank you <laughs>